Hi, my name is Wen Kai. I'm from Duke University. And today I'm, I will be giving uh, our recent study on uh, named data-driven analysis for the heavy quark diffusion coefficients in heavy ion collisions. And uh, this work is mainly done by uh, one of our former group members, Yin Ru Xu. So forgive me if I gave some <laughs> inaccurate descriptions of her approach. And uh, let me begin. So first, uh, let me talk about our simulation setup. So for the initial conditions, and um, specifically for the soft matter part, we used a model called Trento, which, uh, which deposits entropy proportional to an empirical parameterization. So here you can see it's uh, proportional to the square root of TA and TB, which are the nuclear signal functions. But actually in the original form of Trento, uh, uh, it proposed a form, a parameterization that is a generalized mean uh, of TA and TB. And uh, after we do Bayesian analysis uh, on the soft on the soft sector, we we found that the the p factor in the generalized mean is very close to zero, and that's why we choose uh, this form of square root of TA TB here. And for the heavy quarks, uh, we sampled their momentum. Uh, from Fauna, which is a fixed order and next to leading log calculation. And then for the, uh, then for the soft medium evolution, we used uh, event by event two plus one D viscous hydrodynamical model called the Vishnu model, which uh, includes both the shear and bulk viscosities. And again, the soft, uh, all the soft medium related parameters will be calibrated on soft hydronic variables. Uh, using Bayesian analysis. So this is uh, our results uh, of the of calibrating to the soft um, of Dobos uh, at two different collision energies, uh, let at 2.76 TV and 5.02 TV, and uh, across different centralities. And you can see the uh, after the calibration, the, the agreement between data and, and the experimental uh, and our metal calculations are quite well. And for the heavy cock in medium transport part, at Duke we developed two models. One is uh, one is called the improved launch run model, which will, I will be focusing on uh, mainly focusing on in this talk. And another one is called Lido, which is a hybrid model uh, containing both linear Boltzmann and diffusion. So now uh, let let me talk about our improved launch run model. So uh, it, all, it, not only, it not only includes the, uh, the usual drag force and the thermal random force, but also includes uh, recoil forces from the balloon emissions. And the rates for such, such emissions are calculated using the higher twist formalism. And in addition, we consider, uh, we consider the uh, number of contributions uh, to the transport coefficient, uh, for example, the ds 2 pi t, we parameterize it to be a linear combination uh, with, between a particular QCD uh, part and a soft part. And so, and this soft part um, is, is parameterized to be a linear function in temperature. And this, this form of parameterization is inspired uh, by our previous extraction on the bulk viscosities uh, in, the, in the hydrodynamic evolutions. And this gamma factor uh, ranges from zero and one and controls the relative magnitude between uh, these two uh, these two sectors. And as for the uh, hydronization and hydronic rescattering part, so for the uh, for the charm parts hydronizing into D mesons, we use a combined model of recombination and fragmentation. And for the hydronic risk risk rescattering part, we use URKMD. So uh, now let's let me talk about the hydronization model uh, that we use here. So uh, uh, it is uh, if you remember Shan Shan's talk uh, previous earlier today, uh, what we use here is actually a, a simple a earlier version of, of of he has improved in his talk. So uh, for the for the fragmentation part, uh, we're using the the, uh, the long fragmentation, which dominates at high PT, and for the low momentum part, we are using the uh, instantaneous recombination model. And the momentum spectra of 
of those recom recombined mesons and biomes are, um, are dependent on the, um, on the considering quark uh, momentum distributions and the Wigner function. So, and the, the momentum distribution for, for light quarks are, are from, are extracted from the thermal uh, distribution and the momentum for the heavy, the momentum distribution for the heavy quarks uh, draw from uh, the results after uh, the linear Boltzmann, uh, after the uh, Langevin equation evolution. And the Wigner functions are dependent on this uh, sigma parameter, which is again dependent on the mu, on the reduced mass and this also the frequency omega, because we assume that uh, the wave functions are in uh, of a Gaussian uh, Gaussian shape. And so, and also we we fit to get this oscillator frequency omega by fitting to charge radius of the corresponding charge hadrons, and we get those three values uh, for heavy mesons, charm baryons, and uh, beauty baryons. And another in, important ingredient in our study is the Bayesian analysis. So uh, basically, the idea is to answer the following question. Uh, given the model and the experimental data, uh, what values of those parameters can best describe the experimental data? Or uh, in, uh, vice versa, uh, what experimental data can, how, uh, how the experimental data can constrain our model parameters? So uh, again, we have, uh, we have our model in hand and we have uh, the prior of our model parameters. And generally uh, in, in these priors, we are using, um, we're just using uniform distributions because we don't, we don't really know uh, much information about those parameters, uh, except maybe their, uh, their physical range. And then uh, we have this, uh, we introduce this Gaussian process emulator. Uh, this is because uh, typically our models are very computational intensive. And that's why we need, we need a surrogate model uh, trend from the trend from uh, our actual model predictions. And this circuit model can, uh, can basically mimic our model calculations uh, very quickly with, uh, very, with little uncertainties. And after we have our surrogate model, we can use, uh, we can apply the base theorem and do a Markov chain on the color random walk through our uh, parameter space. And then we have, um, then we have the posterior distributions of the parameters. So the base theorem states that the posterior distribution uh, p theta given the experimental data is proportional to the uh, prior distribution p theta, usually a uniform distribution and the likelihood function L. And this likelihood function uh, is not only uh, related to the, to the model predictions, this y theta, uh, which is now calculated using the Gaussian process emulator, but it's also uh, related to the covariance matrix. So this covariance matrix, uh, basically records the, uh, the uncertainties from different uh, parts during our patient analysis. So it, 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 not, it not only uh, accounts for the experimental uncertainties, but also um, our model uncertainties and uh, the uncertainties from the Gaussian process emulator. And it's not uh, just the uncertainties, but also correlations between different, uh, different parameters. So uh, let's see uh, uh, our Bayesian analysis in action. Uh, so, um, as a first study, we just varies the three parameters alpha, beta, and gamma that I just uh, that I discussed uh, previously in in, my, in the talk, and you can see the model predictions uh, or the model calculations uh, using um, using a sample of those model parameters from the prior distributions uh, within these three ranges, and you can see the uh, the model calculations. Uh, spend a very wide range uh, around the, the actual data points. And how do we sample? Uh, the, the sampling technique is uh, called Latin hypercube design, which is a very good, uh, very clever way of, of sampling points in a high dimensional space. And you can see the, the, the sampling uh, results is actually gives us a uniform distribution uh, for those parameters. And another thing to check is, uh, whether our uh, uh, Gaussian emulator 
uh, can actually uh, can, can actually produce our model calculations. And you can see here, uh, indeed, the Gaussian emulator results are very are in line with the model calculations. So with everything uh, with everything in hand, we can now perform our uh, Bayesian analysis. So on the left hand side, this is our uh, extraction extracted posterior distributions for those parameters uh, using different uh, experimental data. So we have gold gold at 200 GV and lead lead at, at two different collision energies. And you can see we don't have a much, we don't have a very good um, extraction for, for, the, for the beta and gamma parameters. However, when we combine um, those uh, experiments, uh, for example, we combine the, the LC energy uh, experiments, the two, uh, the, the green and the blue ones, or we combine the all, all three experiments, we have a better uh, constraints on the on those pram on those model parameters. And this is the model pre prediction using again two hundred random input parameters, but uh, instead of uh, samples from the prior distributions, when we're now sampling those parameters from the posterior distribution. And you can see now um, the, the model calculations can uh, agree pretty well with the data. And so, uh, so again, uh, previously we were doing uh, Bayesian analysis on only three parameters. And now we want to relax um, more constraints and, and, do, uh, and perform extractions on, on even more parameters. So uh, for example, previously we, we fixed the RFS to be 0 0.3 and we fixed the free streaming time tau f to be 0 0.6. And tau f is the time between the initial condition and the time uh, the, the, the charm quarks entering the medium and starts doing energy loss. And again, you can see the, uh, the prior distribution, uh, the sample from the parameters sampled from the prior distribution give a very very wide um, results around around the data, and this is the posterior posterior distribution uh, extracted, and you can see uh, very interestingly the uh, the strong coupling constant of S, uh, the extracted value the mean value is is very close to what we had before uh, around the point three, and and we don't have a very good um, constraints on the on the free streaming time, um, and maybe that's an indication of uh, this 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 uh, this parameter being not very uh, important or relevant uh, when predicting the um, the R A and V two of the beam ions. So uh, this is again the the comparison with experimental data using. Uh, Using sets of parameters sampled from the posterior distribution, and and I think um, and another thing to notice is that um, the individual uh, the individual posterior distributions of the alpha beta gamma parameters are not very interesting because uh, because you can always choose a different um, form of of parameterization of the DS two pi p and maybe you you get Different uh, posterior distribution for the new parameters, but what's interesting is is their uh, joint um, joint contribution to the to the actual uh, posterior distributions of the DS two pi t itself. So here we can see uh, the dependence of DS two pi t on on temperature and momentum, and the, the green band is the prior band uh, is the prior distribution. And uh, the blue band is the posterior distribution. And uh, again, we can compare our um, posterior, posterior distribution uh, of ds 2 pi t with other calculations. So on the on the left hand side, we are comparing to another uh, Bayesian analysis extraction of this ds 2 pi t, but using a different transport approach, the linear Boltzmann uh, approach done by uh, a, another former group member at Duke, uh, Wei Yao. And on the right, you can see uh, our comparisons with other model calculations and lattice. Um, so I, I think the, 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 the results are a little spread uh, at near TC, but I think uh, 
most of them are around around a fixed value five, which I'll be using uh, in later calculations. And so here again is um, is a single calculation um, using a set of uh, best estimated parameters. And what's new here is uh, we have three uh, three set of lines. So the the charm, the green line, the green dash line is uh, is from the charm charm clock results before right before hydronization, and the blue line is uh, the demeson results uh, after hydronization, but before hydronic rescattering. And the, the blue the red lines is after everything uh, is the final results. So we can see uh, the the charm clock results already gives the, the rough shape of, of both RA and, and V2. But for, uh, for V2 specifically at low PT, uh, hydronization and hydronic risk scatterings uh, further enhances the, the V2 and uh, bring us closer to the actual data. And we can also use those extracted parameters to predict uh, other model, uh, to, to predict other observables, uh, for example, the V3. And uh, okay, this is again the the same plot uh, from two slides ago. So this is the best estimate of RE and V2 from our uh, Bayesian analysis. And this is the uh, HA and HV, HV2. I, I believe this is a homework assignment uh, uh, like a, a year ago. And this is using a fixed DS2 pi t equals to four. So uh, we can see the uh, the, the general agreement with data is still pretty good. Uh, as, as we can see, uh, our extraction is very close to uh, to around five in previous slides, but uh, we can see some discrepancy between uh, between the data and uh, and the calculation uh, for the V two uh, at low PT. And here we can see the V two has uh, is systematically the HV2 is systematically low one and have a decreasing trend compared to the uh, effect line uh, around one in our previous calculation. And so now comes to my uh, conclusion. We basically performed a data-driven analysis on the diffusion coefficients of charm clocks uh, in heavy collisions. And this study uh, mainly focuses on heavy clock diffusion. The initial condition the hydrodynamics, the hydronization, and hydronic transport are uh, all uses all uses calibrated results from previous studies, and our current estimation is is compared to lattice and other model calculations, and we see some uh, we see some tension near uh, near the critical temperature, and I think to, to further reduce the uncertainties, both uh, the experimental and systematic or emulator uncertainties needs to be improved. And if you want to see a further systematic comparison between different transport models or initial condition and hydro models, you can find, uh, you can look into uh, the paper here. And that's all for my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Wen Kai, for this uh, nice presentation. Thank you. So let's see if there are some questions from the room or from outside. Paul. Well, it's not really a question, it, it is a comment. Uh, somehow DS in your approach is a parameter. And, and then on, on the top of the collisional energy loss that is ruled by this DS, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have also some radiative energy loss, correct? Yes. Yes, but then if you can go back to this curve where you show this ds as a function of the temperature, the optimal okay. fit. Um, uh, this one? Yeah, the, no. No, so, so the one where you compare with the other models. Yes. yes. Then here it is uh, a bit of an issue because what you plot is a ds that is only the collisional part of the diffusion. But nevertheless, due to the fact you have also radiative emission, the genuine DS, the, the, the one that the heavy quarks is feeling, has both the collisional and the radiative contribution, 
which might be small. But, but nevertheless, what, what you compare here with the other models is not the genuine DS. For instance, in our model, you see that we have a contribution both from the collisional and from the radiative. So, so here you're not comparing with a genuine quantity, you're comparing a parameter of your model. And, and, and this you, you have to take a, a bit into account for the next, uh, at some point. Thank okay. you. Um, yes. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I, if I get your question, uh, but I think in, uh, in in Ruth's study, he he is doing something that's that's including both the. I, I think this is like a, essentially an effective DS, uh, which which includes both the uh, the drag and the radiation ones, because the 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 radiation energy loss, um, the Q hat is also related to the to DS or uh, by Einstein relations, I believe. So I think. Yes. I think the there, 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 is, there is someone's comment. Uh, sorry, but DS is calculated at uh, in zero momentum limit. I mean, there is no radiation uh, energy loss. Sure, because you're interacting with photons that are at a finite velocity. I mean, that result doesn't depend on radiation energy loss. It does. It, 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 oh, but it, it actually, does actually because you are interacting DSS with photons. We, we are interacting with patterns that are nevertheless at finite velocity. So even if yourself you are at zero velocity, you can still be hit by patterns that are relativistic, and, and then there, there will be some gluons which will be radiated. It's not that much, okay? That's for sure. But still, it is there. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm convinced it is. Okay, so I think that on that we can conclude the afternoon session.